Welcome to the West Virginia School of Preaching video lectureship. This is the last lesson in our series on fear and we are excited that you are watching them and, and appreciate that uh, and we hope that it is beneficial for you. Peter Ray Cole will be bringing us a lesson on the Christian response to depression. Peter Ray Cole is a graduate of the school and now a faculty member of the school as a teacher in the marriage and family class. He has a Bible degree and also a license uh, in counseling. He is a minister at the Washington Street Church of Christ in Fairview, West Virginia, and he, he is married to Amantha Cole, and they are proud parents of their daughter. Uh, they, Peter Ray has gone on various mission trips to India, and he's a board member of the West Virginia Christian Youth Camp. And we are excited for his lesson, The Christian Response to Depression. In the 51st Psalm, verses 8 and 12, David gives hope to all of those who endure dark days. In verse 8, he says, Make me hear joy and gladness. In verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. David is dealing with, at this time, repentance. And his repentance has led to godly sorrow, as Paul told the church in Corinth, godly sorrow produces repentance. In his time of godly sorrow, David is also enduring a time of depression. His depression comes out of a commissioned murder of Uriah the Hittite. His depression comes from his sin of adultery also with Bathsheba. His depression comes at the loss of an infant child. The Bible tells us that there are dark days that we're all going to endure. That there are valleys of shadows of death in the 23rd Psalm. That God is always with us, yet those valleys are always going to be there. Many times we find great heights of joy and great depths of sorrow. And in this 51st Psalm, verses 8 and 12, gladness, joy, and restoration, recognizing the joy of salvation is possible. You see, what we find is that depression can come for a variety of reasons. Sometimes, like David, we endure depression because of our sin. Yet at other times, we endure our depression not because of sin, but sometimes because of a chemical imbalance that occurs in the brain that God has given us. And other times, we even have to admit there are times of depression that we really cannot pinpoint why it is we are so depressed, yet we still find ourselves in a feeling of despair without hope and so very, very lonely. Throughout the Bible, we find numerous examples of depression being spoken of, and the New Testament Christian is given examples written for our learning in the Old Testament to help us to understand how to deal with many varieties of aspects of life. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, as Solomon, the wisest man other than Jesus to ever walk this earth, gives us a time in our lives as we age and as we mature and as this tent that soon shall be shed begins to decay, he says in the 12th verse of Ecclesiastes, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before all of the aspects of age begin to break down. Before you find the days have very little joy. You know, sometimes we reach an age, not because of sin and not because of anything that we have done, but because our bodies have aged, that we find depression, because our grinders are low, because it's difficult to hear and see, and because we're not able to be out with our brotherhood, our family of God, any longer, we can find ourselves depressed at times not just because of sin, but because of the situation that we find ourselves in. Sometimes our depression is because of sin. Sometimes our depression is because life has ups and downs, heights of joy and depths of sorrow. In the 23rd Psalm, we get a picture of this, a small glimpse of the idea of even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me, thou art with me. The idea that the psalmist is trying to get us to understand is sometimes death is so near it's a shadow, yet God is with us. And no matter how difficult our despair becomes, God is always with us. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 13, the inspired word of God says that temptation is common to all men. 
No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. If you go earlier in this chapter, you're going to find that all of the Israelites were dealing with a variety of sin. And they of the older generation were battling this. And now God tells us that we also are going to be tempted in all points. Yet we are with sin, unlike Jesus Christ. And so what we begin to find in 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 13 is that God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to withstand. You know, sometimes this verse has been criticized based on our interpretation. Many times we like to say that God will never give us more than we can handle. God will never put on your plate more than you can handle. Lately, this interpretation has come under some criticism that may be false. For example, the common thought today is, well, there are things in this life that we can't handle. Many times we see cancer as an example. Somebody has cancer. It's a terminal illness. It's a, it's a difficult statement to hear, you have cancer. But then we say, this is more than a person can handle. Sometimes people have used as an example the idea of marriage that just couldn't be saved because of adulterous relationships. And we say, this is more than you can handle. But the Bible says something very different. The Bible says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and by the pen of Peter, God has given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. That means God has shown us through His written Word, through the life of Jesus Christ and the salvation we find in His blood, and through the examples written for our learning in the Old Testament, that we are able to endure those dark days, those valleys where the shadow of death is present. We are able to handle the heights of joy and not lose our focus on God and to keep our priorities where they need to be. God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. The Bible says rejoice always. And he teaches us, even though Paul was in prison when he penned these words, he taught us how to have joy even in difficult circumstances. The Bible tells us I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And so it may be the case that it's not that we cannot handle, but we are able to handle all things because of Jesus Christ. God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to handle. God will never put more on your plate than you are able to deal with because we deal with our lives through Jesus Christ. I understand we say God's got this. It's become a popular phrase. We must understand the reason that God has this is because we are able to do this through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without Christ, I am a wretched sinner without any hope of salvation. Yet the psalmist said in 51 verse 12 that we are able to have our joy restored if we repent and if we begin to deal with the sorrow and the sadness that comes about. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 to the New Testament Christian is a way that we are able to respond to depression by being able to look at this and say, God has a way out for me. God has a method, a means for me to be able to endure this dark day and even at times to be able to conquer this dark day. When we think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, if we understand that we have all things pertaining to life and godliness, if we understand I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, we better understand Revelation verse two, chapter 2 and verse 10, where he says, Be thou found faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. What do we understand from this? Well, ultimately, the worst thing that can ever happen to the New Testament Christian is that we die and go to heaven. This ought to motivate us, that nothing bad can happen to me that is so great that I will lose my salvation unless I allow sin to conquer me. And God said, I will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to withstand. God will never allow us to be tempted so greatly that we are unable to say, get thee behind me, Satan, as our great example, Jesus Christ, spoke. 
And so when we think about the idea of depression, we recognize that throughout the Bible, there are numerous examples of depression, that there are many individuals who struggle with depression in their life. If we just stay in the book of Psalms, Psalm 6 and 13, 18, 23, all of these Psalms that we have on our screen deal with some capacity of depression. Even in the 23rd Psalm, if you're in the valley of the shadow of death, it's very likely that you're dealing with a sense of depression. A good friend of mine in his older age was diagnosed with cancer. And the first round of cancer, he was able to defeat with chemotherapy and a variety of medicines. But just a few months later, his cancer came back. And this time, it was terminal. The doctors told him the phrase that many of us fear, get your things in order, your time is very limited. Within just a short period of time, he went from a seemingly healthy man to a very, very sick man. At the end of his life, he had hospice coming in, and his wife pulled the hospice nurse aside, and they were talking about some concerns that the wife had. He asked his son, what are they whispering about? And his son candidly told him, mom thinks you're depressed. I'll never forget as the story was relayed to me what he said. I am depressed. What do you expect? I'm dying. There are a variety of times in our life that we feel like this is more than we can handle. If we are a New Testament Christian, we are able to endure. You may be in the valley of the shadow of death. Your time may be drawing to an end. As Paul said, the drink offering is about to be complete, all the way poured out. But Christ, the righteous judge, will judge those in the end. Christ will see us on the day of judgment, and He will say, Come unto me, thou good and faithful servant. You see, this is similar to the hope that we find in that 51st Psalm, verses 8 and 12. Restore and make me hear. Make me hear gladness. Make me hear singing. There is a way out. When you look at Genesis in chapter 15, we find the character of Abraham who is struggling with a time of depression. Jonah in chapter 4, dealing with sorrow and depression. The entire book of Job deals with a man who has sorrow, not because of sin of his own, but because these are the circumstances of life. Death happens, loss occurs, financial ruin may come about, and it has nothing to do with our own sin. It may be the sin of others. It could be our sin, or it could just be a chemical in our brain that we have no control over whatsoever. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 19, deals with a horrific battle of depression to one point where he even says, God, I just want to die. Let it be no more. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul deals with depression. A heart-wrenching story in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 7 through 10 where a woman is without child and even to the point her sorrow is so great that her husband says, Am I not better to you than seven, than ten, than many sons? And Hannah still weeps because she yearns to be a mother and to hold a child in her arms. Habakkuk in chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 is dealing with depression to such a great degree that he even questions, God, can you hear me? God, what is the reason that you are no longer listening to me? Well, what we understand when we think about depression is there are a variety of degrees of depression. We're going to generically categorize them in this lesson in three different views. First, the blues. I know you're probably thinking right now that I'm going to make a joke about da-da-da-da-da. But really, the blues are very common and experienced by all people. As a matter of fact, statistics would tell us that 80% of all Western people have dealt with depression. All people in the United States, 80% of them have dealt with depression. I believe the other 20% lied. Everybody deals with depression. We all go through these valleys and through these peaks in our lives. And so when we look at this in the category of the blues and how this difficult time bothers us, we're able to identify the blues based upon the idea of this is a few hours or a few days. And you don't feel your regular self. Something's off. And you really can't put your finger on it. 
maybe a friend calls and says, let's go out for a cup of coffee. And generally you would say yes, but this time you say, no, I really just don't feel like it. Maybe the example best to describe this is about when your child is five years old and they're going to go to kindergarten for the first time. You put them on the school bus and they anxiously leave your hand and climb up those big steps. The bus pulls out and you walk back up to the driveway sobbing. You go into your home and you find their bedclothes still on their bed and you pick them up and you smell them and they smell like your little child who once was in your arms and now wants to be with their friends at school. That's the blues. It lasts for a couple hours, maybe even up to three days. But then eventually you snap out of it and you start putting little pictures on your refrigerator that your child has drawn. You start putting up all the math and all the recital, all that they have done, and a different kind of joy replaces those blue feelings. Maybe it's when you give your son your baseball glove. And you find out that as you give your son your baseball glove, that he doesn't want your glove. He wants his favorite player's ball glove. That's the blues. The blues are difficult because they're based on circumstances where often we feel bad. We have loss. We have sorrow because of a circumstance in our life. And sometimes, lasting up to two weeks, we find the aspect of depression. We're not eating regularly. And we're either sleeping too much or we're staying up all hours of the night. Our schedule has completely changed. We're still able to complete our daily tasks. And we'll take a shower, but our hygiene isn't as good as what it used to be. Maybe we'll go a couple days before we bathe. We don't really fix our hair. We really don't put on clothes during the day. We just stay in our pajamas all day. This is a depression, and it needs to be dealt with. Sometimes we find clinical depression. Now, clinical depression is something that we find that can be very dangerous because this is where we deal with thoughts of suicide. That now, all of a sudden, our idea of depression goes from this is something that's going to pass to I don't think this is ever going to end, and I'm in the pits of despair. It's going to last more than two weeks, and I have no motivation. I'm very lethargic in everything I do. I'm not responding to encouragement. I'm isolating myself, and I find that I have no will to live, and this becomes very dangerous. Because maybe you're dealing with a situation like this where you feel like, I have no motivation, I have no purpose, I have no passion, and the people in my life are not supporting me. Every person in this world needs three things to continue in their life. One, everybody needs people, people, purpose, and passion. People in your life that encourage you. People in your life that are able to admonish you. People in your life that are loving enough to be able to tell you, hey, you need to make a change. Hey, there's something that's wrong here. We need to do something different. People who understand who you are and will support who you are. The Bible tells us bad company corrupts good morals. We need good people in our life. People are important because God made us in such a way that we are to be sociable. Number two, everybody needs purpose. What is your responsibility? What is your purpose in this life? What is it that you look at and say, this is what I'm able to do. This is my talent, and this is how I will bring glory to God. This is my responsibility. Number three, everybody needs a passion. What motivates me? And what is the purpose of what I am doing? And what is the reason that I'm seeking this out and that I'm wanting to accomplish these goals? Everybody needs good people. Everybody needs a responsibility, a purpose. Everyone needs a passion, a motivation to get up in the morning and comb your hair and brush your teeth and put on deodorant. Everybody needs this. When we're clinically depressed, we don't have this anymore because we have isolated ourselves from everyone that we know. There are notable Bible characters in the Old and New Testament. Today we're going to focus on just the Old Testament. Notable Bible characters who have battled depression at a variety of times in their life. For example, Moses is one that comes to mind. Moses in the book of Numbers in chapter 11 and verses 1 through 5 was dealing with the blues. He was tired of the quarreling. He was tired of the constant complaining and he goes to God and he talks to his confidant and he says, look, this is a problem. 
These people you have given me are wearing me out. Moses has dealt with the blues. There are other examples, by the way, where Moses has dealt with depression. There are other times in his life that Moses has dealt even with clinical depression, I believe the Bible teaches us. David in the 31st Psalm deals with depression. And then we see also Job in chapter 7, verses 2 through 3, where he even questions his life and says, Why has this happened? Why have was I even born? Jeremiah in chapter 20, verses 14 through 18. We struggle with this. Professionals even struggle with Jeremiah in trying to analyze, was he clinically depressed or was he depressed? And the reason for this difficulty is the lines begin to blur. The blues can very quickly turn into depression if we don't find motivation, people, purpose, passion. The state of depression that we often find ourselves in can turn into clinical depression if we don't do something about it. You know, the Bible talks about medicine, and it may be the case that our depression needs some medicine to help us get out of this. It may be that we need some motivation and not medicine to be able to deal with this. It may be that we need to talk to a professional and find someone who is able to help us deal with this and help us navigate. Is it medicine or is it conversation or is it a combination of the two? If you're dealing with clinical depression that's not brought on by drugs or alcohol, you need to see a professional. You need to see a professional soon. Now, the Bible has in the book of 1 Kings, in chapter 19, an account of the great prophet Elijah. You remember in 1 Kings, in chapter 18, where we find the prophet defeating the 450 prophets and the 400 prophets of Baal and Asheroth. And so now these 850 prophets have been defeated. It's the greatest achievement, the wonderful miracle that was able to be performed where he calls down lightning from heaven and God answers his request and the altar is consumed. Now you would think that at the height of this wonderful achievement where glory has been brought to God, that Elijah would be ecstatic and he would be able for the rest of his life to lean on this great moment. The truth of it is, many times those great pinnacle times of achievement are followed by great periods of depression. Sometimes Satan comes after us in a variety of ways, in a variety of means. When we have that great pinnacle moment in our lives, be aware that it's possible that a state of depression is coming next. This happens to those who have great sports achievements that they find themselves now on a boat by themselves after winning the Super Bowl, and many people think they're going to die out there. They're going to take their own lives. This happens when we have this great moment of success, and then because of overwhelm, because of the energy placed into that previous event, we become tired. Sometimes, like 1 Kings in chapter 18, we find the problem is that there are others who are chasing after us, and we're exhausted, and we become afraid. In 1 Kings in chapter 19, in the first four verses, Jezebel is so angry with the prophet Elijah that she makes an oath that he will be dead by tomorrow, or let me, Jezebel, be dead. And so she sends those evil armies to chase after Elijah. And as they chase after him and after he runs, after he flees, he finds himself in a state of depression in 1 Kings and chapter 19. Listen to what he says in verse 4. And he prayed that he might die. It is enough, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. The prophets who have been sawn asunder, Possibly he's talking about those. I am no better than my fathers, possibly those of his genealogy and his family tree who are now in the grave. Just let me be dead too. Possibly talking about difficulties and difficult times in other people's lives where he said they died. Why can't I also go to the grave? It cannot be argued that Elijah is in anything but a time of sorrow and despair. And he's thinking irrationally. It's one of the signs of depression, even clinical depression, that now he finds himself dealing with a dark day and he doesn't know how to handle it and he finds himself feeling overwhelmed and he's telling God, God, just end everything. 
But look at God's plan. God's plan to deal with depression. And the Christian's response ought to be very similar to what we find God showing Elijah in how to deal with this difficult time. In verses 5 and 6 in 1 Kings chapter 19, Then as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel, a messenger, touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank, and he laid down again. Do you see what happens? It's time to start again. Elijah had lost his rational view to the point that he wasn't eating correctly. He wasn't sleeping correctly. And he wasn't getting his daily exercise. His routine had been taken away. And now that irrational thought props into his mouth because he's been isolated and he proclaims to God, it is better for me to be dead. Can you imagine the great prophet Elijah saying, I can do no more good in this world after just defeating 850 prophets? Yet this is what happens many times when depression enters into our lives and it begins to haunt us and it begins to hurt us and it makes us begin to think, what else can I do but die? And God says, you can start living again. Now, many times when we are in the thrust of depression, when we are in the throes of this sorrow, we don't like to hear things that are motivational. We just want to curl up and die. We just want to pull the blanket up over our head and rest a little bit longer. But God says it's time to eat and to eat right. God provided the nutrition that He needed. It's not time for junk food. It's time for some good food, not just comfort food good nutritional food. God made this, and it was not junk. God said, it's time for you to drink, to get your thirst back into where it needs to be, to be able to restore yourself. It's time to start again. And so when you battle depression, regardless of what level it is on, you need to compel yourself, force yourself to get up and to take a shower. Do you remember what it was like when you were a little kid and you came home sick? And your mom and dad maybe couldn't keep you because of their own responsibilities, and so you went to grandma's house. And when you went to grandma's house, when you called home sick, she had on the couch a a sheet put over it, and you could lay on that couch, and she would brush the hair out of your forehead, and she would say, honey, what do you want to eat? Nobody made a grilled cheese and a tomato soup like my grandma. Nobody was able to give me comfort like my grandmother and to make me feel special and to help me get back on my feet because I'd been sick. Do you even remember when you would feel better and she would come in and you were maybe watching your favorite Andy Griffith show, you were watching your favorite Care Bears and she would come in and you'd lay back down real quick and she'd say, how are you feeling? And you should have said, I feel better, Grandma. But you kind of liked the attention and you said, well... I'm a little bit better. (laughs) You see, we get like that when we're depressed. We don't want to motivate. We don't want to feel better. We want to waller in it a little bit. We want to roll around in this, and, and it's very hard to find motivation. So here's what God tells us. Start again. What can I do today and accomplish it? I'm going to get up, and I'm going to make my bed. I'm going to get up, make my bed, and I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to get up and I'm going to change my clothes and put different clothes on. I'm going to go outside and take a walk. I'm going to breathe in some deep, fresh air. I'm going to read about others who conquered depression. I'm going to go out and seek professional help if needed. I'll take the medication as prescribed if needed. I'll go see a therapist if needed. I'm going to start again because I will not allow this depression to swallow me up because I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to start again. And I'm going to stop hiding. In 1 Kings in chapter 19 and verse 9, the Bible says, And there went there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You see, God had told him to start again. God had given him everything that he needed to begin to refresh himself. And what did he do? Elijah went and hid in a cave. 
What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, I have people for you to go see. I have a purpose for you and the responsibilities, and I have motivation for you. I have your passion that you need to continue to do this. Stop hiding. Find a friend, a confidant, someone you can trust, someone that you would take advice from because they've been, for, been there for you in the past. Stop hiding. What are you doing here? Are you starting again? Are you going to stop hiding? Are you finding the motivation that you need to get up and to go and to do exactly what it is that you need to do? The Bible tells us in chapter 19, verses 15 through 17, that it's time to get active, stay busy. Then the Lord said to him, verse 15 of 1 Kings chapter 19, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. I have a responsibility for you. Here is a passion for you and the motivation to get this done, because he says Jehu in verse 17 will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And then he gives him more motivation. There are 7,000 reserved in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal. He says that because I and I alone am left in verse 10. No, you're not. You see, that's what depression will do when you're not starting again. And when you're not getting out and being active, but rather you're hiding. And when you're not staying busy that irrational thought begins to grow greater and greater and you become paranoid. I'm the only one. No, you're not. You're not the only one. You're created in the image of God. You're an individual who needs to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Christ because you have salvation and it's time for your joy to be restored. Start again. Get up. Make your bed. Take a shower. Pat yourself on the back for the accomplishment that you have made. Look in the mirror and comb your hair. Brush your hair. Fix your hair. Put on your clothes for the day and call someone and tell them how God has blessed you in your life. Tell someone that you were thinking about them and you wanted to give them a little bit of encouragement because maybe you thought they were going through a difficult time. You don't have to talk about yourself. You don't have to talk about your problems, but recognize that you have a responsibility to be sociable with your brethren. Go to Bible class. Go to periods of worship and say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the household of faith. Let us go into the house of worship. Let's go sing a joyful song to God. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Make me hear gladness. Make me, even in those times that I don't want to hear it. The Christian's response to depression ought to be, I'm going to start again, I'm going to stop hiding, and I'm going to stay busy. A very important person in my life who's had great influence told me a story of a time in her life when she was depressed. She said there was no reason for her to be depressed. She was living in Florida at the time. Her husband was in the Navy. They just had their first baby girl and everything should have been perfect. But she found herself depressed. She lost a serious amount of weight, a significant amount of weight to the point that she was no longer healthy. Her hands shook and trembled all the time. And she called her mother and she said, What do I do? And her mother just kept saying, Stay busy. Get your mind focused on something good and give your hands something to do. Pick up a new hobby. Learn how to knit. Learn how to crochet. Learn how to braid. Learn how to woodwork. Learn how to do something. Get busy. Not just because that idle hand and the devil's workshop saying that we often use, but because you have people who care about you and love you very much, because you were created in the image of God, because you have people who are praying for you and even wanting you to hear this message so it will motivate you to be able to find a direction and a path to begin dealing with this time of depression. Because you have a purpose, and that purpose is to share the image of God that is in you to all the world. We are the reflection of God. We are created in His image. We are what the world sees. Not that they cannot see depression, but that they're able to see this is how a Christian responds to depression. Depression is very normal in our lives. 
What is abnormal to God is when we give up and give into our depression. So stay active, stay busy. Get something going in your life. The Bible tells us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And God will never allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to withstand. And through Jesus Christ, we are able to deal with all the difficulties in life that we face. God bless you. We thank Peter Rayco for bringing us that lesson tonight. We thank you for watching tonight. Many of you may have watched all week during this video lectureship, and we're thankful for that. As always, if you have any questions about anything that we said or have questions about the church, have questions about the school preaching here at the West Virginia School of Preaching in Moundsville, we'd hope that you would reach out to us via our website, wvsop.com. Thank you very much. Good night.